So it's a pretty uh, long passage, so I won't read it all here. In fact, I recommend the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Bleep, and it's censored, is obviously, you know, the F word, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Blank. And the quote, the passage has to do with people's ambitions and goals and desires. Now, everyone wants the good life. They don't want to just be a cubicle monkey like I often am in my life. They don't, uh, people want to have the corner office, the nice car, the nice house, the great sex life, the wonderful, fulfilling family life, a great legacy to build on, vacation time, good health. These are obvious things that everyone wants. So if you ask someone, what do they want? They'll give some version that includes these things. But in this passage in the book, it talks about what are you willing to feel pain for and what kind of pain are you willing to have? What kind of pain do you want? So this is a compelling point, and I think it makes the... It's demonstrative of how the book itself is pretty poignant. But it's also an interesting question that is worth asking yourself. What kind of pain do you want? So this question starts with the premise that there is no avoiding pain. And this is an assumption that is so reasonable and so obviously true that no one can seem to avoid pain. Sometimes people can find ways to reduce pain. Sometimes dull it temporarily or let it come roaring back. Sometimes find ways to get pain as well tolerated as possible in the most wholesome of ways. Or they get it completely wrong and just endure pain in the most excruciating way possible for both big and small things. So I have somatization disorder, which it's no longer officially called that. It's now a form of somatoform disorder. But the description for somatization disorder is a better description of what I have than the, the more modern somatoform disorder. So it's a categorization thing. But either way, it's basically a little bit, for me, like psychosomatic symptoms on steroids so everyone can get psychosomatic symptoms they're very stressed they're very anxious perhaps some hair falls out or they it feels like they can't swallow or their eye gets red or um, even their nose gets runny all sorts of incredible and horrible things can happen uh, when you feel anxious stressed depressed or otherwise are in some kind of emotional turmoil and people have noticed that different kinds of emotional distress will trigger different sorts of physical symptoms for some people for some people it's one size fits all or simply some types of stress triggers all the symptoms and some do not or it's random it's very poorly understood we know that statistically people who are women and people who have been sexually abused hey sweetheart are much more likely there's a cat here uh, much more likely or significantly more likely to have it than the general public but that's not always the case as it is not the case with myself I had a very good childhood I'm a privileged male in all the ways that a person can be privileged pretty much everything except wealth um, and uh, you know perhaps obviously complete um, uh, mental normality which I would love to not be a neurotic wreck as I can be a lot of the time and historically have been even worse. So somatization is just that psychosomatic symptoms, but dialed up, like very keenly sensitive to it, very well uh, attuned to it, to the point that you almost are always on guard of keeping your mind as tranquil as you can and trying to respond to emotional stimuli as uh in, in as measured and calibrated a way as you possibly can because you're fearing the physical symptoms that will come if you don't and in a weird way even though it's been much of the time crippling and isolating and uh, like a living nightmare other times it has been a blessing because it shook me to my core to really begin to go on a journey where I needed to understand just how important emotional health is, how much I was lacking with emotional intelligence, 
how much knowledge and mental training and discipline I needed through different variations and forms of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, both through professional therapy and through self-learning. And just the essential nature of all of this for actually being a functioning person. And I think that it's not that unique to somatoform disorder or somatization disorder. I think in my case, it's just very acutely obvious if I have like a red eye or a runny nose for no reason or all sorts of horrible GI distress and pain and discomfort um, and the the fatigue, uh, which still gets me a kind of um, feels like a, an aching, dull pain, like a backpack uh, filled with so much weight placed on you, weighing you down and needles in your skin. It can be horrible, but right now, as an example, it can also be very much in relief and all of the usual things that help a person with depression or anxiety typically will also typically help somatization disorder everything from uh touching petting a cat i'm petting a cat right now um hugging uh cuddling uh sexuality i don't know why i jump to the physical things first because the main things are proper nutrition, fitness, cardio especially, even though I'm such a proponent of weightlifting as the real ticket to reshaping the body when it comes to somatization disorder. For me, it's cardio that does the biggest difference with relieving those physical symptoms, those physiological symptoms. So uh, getting enough sleep, not getting too much sleep, sleeping properly, meditation, all of the things and you don't have to do all of them and you won't be able to do all of them depending on who you are in the context you're in i can't always do all of them but you know vitamins and minerals to the amount and type that it's sufficient and proper for you just all of the kinds of things that are established and proven to help anxiety and depression are likely and plausible and i believe and anecdotally will help physical symptoms of somatization and somatoform disorder, depending on your variation, of course. So that's what I have to say about that, but it's all about pain. Somatization disorder is all about pain. So it's deciding what kind of pain you want. And this is not unique to me or people with this disorder. This is a choice for everyone. The choice is what kind of pain do you want? You have to assume that you will have a pain. Do you want the mental discomfort of telling someone the hard truth? Or do you want the later on different kind of mental discomfort of them being upset with you that you didn't tell them or that worst you lied to them? Do you want the physical pain of jogging or walking fast or running or uh, swimming? Or do you want the discomfort uh, from somatization disorder later from your feeling of needles in your esophagus, you will feel some kind of pain. It's just a question of how much, and most of all, what you can decide is what kind of pain do you want? Because you will, you will be in pain your entire life. That's how you know you're alive. And we end up causing ourselves gratuitous pain. I certainly cause myself gratuitous pain by insisting to myself on some primal level believing that we can get out of pain that we can avoid pain we can't really not really and it's a lie we tell ourselves because our impulse is to move toward pleasure and away from pain and in the short term that helps us achieve exactly that but in the long term so much of being addicted to pleasure, being addicted to the dopamine spikes of the delicious food or um, some kind of release or uh, some kind of hit from certain kinds of drugs, not all drugs, but certain kinds, the dopamine that can come from that or whatever the given thing or addiction is, and almost anything can be an addiction if it gives you a dopamine spike and you're using it to escape and you feel that you're compelled to do it. 
Um, I'm very lucky in that I've not had to struggle with addiction issues, but many people with somatization disorder have, and they are fighting the good fight, and you know we wish them the very, very best. But that's so much related to all of this because so much of addiction is chasing pleasure not for its sake of we just want hedonistic pleasure, but specifically avoiding pain. Take an extreme example. If someone shoots their arm with heroin, they're not doing it just because they want that pleasure. They want the relief. They want the pain of not having the heroin gone. And when they first do it, or the second time they do it, they also know that e euphoria of relief. I think there's much truth in Stoicism and in many forms of Buddhist practice as well. There's lots to be skeptical about as well, depending on how it's worded or phrased or taught. And I don't know that anything should be taken as gospel, uh, not to uh, use a loaded term there. But I think that there's a lot of wisdom to be found in there. And one is one important nugget is that by only chasing pleasure and only trying to avoid pain, we often will cause extra gratuitous forms of pain that are more severe and more traumatizing or disconcerting than we would have had from the beginning. So it is a question of what kind of pain do we want and how much total pain do we want? And therefore, it's kind of a long-term planning thing. You know, a little bit of pain now or a lot of pain later. It's not always a choice as simple as that. Sometimes the choice of pain X now or pain Y later. Well, I like X a little bit more than Y is a little worse, but then again, I can handle X a little bit better right now, etc. So it is complicated and it's more nuanced than simply the equivalent of financial or investment planning but it's worth thinking about and it's worth remembering the axiom that you can't avoid pain you just have to choose what kind of pain you prefer and then embrace that pain because that pain will bring you meaningful rewards that you want and to think about pleasure as being a reward rather than a goal this one is so difficult for me to remember so much of my life and I would have achieved so much more if I thought of rest slash pleasure as being a reward and positive side effect rather than the goal itself and so many different tasks and errands and missions that I've set myself upon. But I'm still hopefully reasonably young yet, not, um, you know, new Star Trek 2009 Captain Kirk Young, but more like, you know... Han Solo, New Hope, Young. So that wasn't necessary as an analogy. But thank you so much for checking out my, my vlog here. And I'll see you guys next time.